Welcome back to our shop just outside Kennesaw here in North Georgia. One of you that follow the channel know that I've got a uh, particular affinity to old vices. I don't know why and I don't know where it came from, but it's just something that I, uh, I, I enjoy dealing with. Well, this weekend I picked up two and uh, we were out uh, looking for a yard sale and saw a sign that said, man stuff. And we pulled into a field. There was a a building back there and they didn't really have a lot but as I was walking up I saw laying in the grass just this horribly rusted antique blacksmith's leg vise or leg post vise or post vise. What these vices were used for they were mounted either to a building door or to a stand and they used by blacksmiths to pound on because they have this leg that goes down to the ground. In the old days they would put these outside the barn or outside the shop and then set them on a piece of uh, a big rock, very big rock in the ground or do that inside the shop or whatever. But most of these were kept outside and most of them are horribly rusty. Well this one's laying in the grass, it's completely rusted out. I talked to the lady, she said it was her grandfather's. Uh, she asked me uh, what I wanted to pay for it. I told her, long story short, we settled on $30 and I took it home. My wife thought I was out of my mind. Now, I planned on making a video on how I restored this, and I have to apologize because here's, here's what's happened. I was researching the vice online, and it was about 10.30 at night by the time I found the information I wanted, and that is how to identify the maker. So I ran out to the shop to see if I could find the maker's mark on it, and of course it was obstructed by rust, and I thought that it might be underneath this yoke that mounts the vice to whatever you attach it to. So I pounded out the wedge and took the yoke off. It wasn't there. When the wedge came out, of course, the spring comes off. So then, because I'm who I am, I just started to disassemble it. And by 12.30 that night, I had it all apart in pieces. And I was able to identify it. It's an Iron City vise, which was made in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They began production of these, I think, in the 1850s. They started using the... Uh, the Maker's Mark, which is a six-pointed star with the word Iron City in it, I think around right after the Civil War sometime. Turns out this one is completely hand-forged. When I took it apart, I was just amazed all the work. For example, this collar, and I'll bring you in shortly to show you, it was made of a single piece of steel, and it was actually bent around and then fuse-welded. Uh, these balls on the end of this, of this handle are fuse-welded. There's fuse weldings under here. Uh, it's just it's just a remarkable piece of antique ironwork, and I am so so happy to have it. I didn't make a video. I did take some pictures, and I'll show you the only before picture that I have right now. Basically what I did is I took it all apart and I wire brushed everything. I got all the rust off it, got it polished up with the wire brush, and then because I don't like to paint these, I just coated it in fluid film, which is a lanolin-based uh, anti-rust product that I've become very fond of. And you can buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's, and if it's not there, buy it on Amazon. And this is the this is the finish we came up with. Now this isn't permanently mounted. I just have it bolted to the uh, to the grinder stand right now only because I just don't know where I'm going to put it yet but I didn't want it laying on the ground so here it is I'm going to bring you in I'll take you around it just let you know that I've got it and uh, I'm going to enjoy it and here it is from the side and this is the mounting mechanism it's this hand forged yoke that goes around the, the leg that goes to the ground and it's held in with a single wedge 
and you can see this is hand formed. Those holes are not round. They were made by heating the heating the metal up and then punching a a punch through it. This here is called the screw box. <clears throat> it has threads in it that accepts the threaded shaft. These screws, the screws are actually put in and brazed into the casting uh, or or the forging because at the time they didn't have the technology to cut the uh, to cut the screws in uh, with a lathe. My understanding is Charles Parker Vice Company is the first one to be able to manufacture that that way, and I think that was around 1880, but I'm not positive. And you can see here's the jaws, and we'll go down the post or the leg, and here is the pivoting mechanism, giant hand cast nut, a hand forged bolt that goes through the other side. This is the spring. What this spring does is it puts tension on the pivoting arm and it allows the arm to come out when you loosen the, the uh, screw and then when you tighten the screw back up as you can see the spring compresses. The springs are hand forged. This may be a replacement. I, I thought it was a replacement initially because it had these holes in it but then when I look at it it looks to be forged as well so I'm just not sure but uh, that's the spring assembly. Here's the pivoting and then if you go down to the bottom you can see I'm going to turn you sideways here how that that's built. We have this bulbous protrusion here so this one inch piece could set into the ground and it would keep the leg from dancing around. And to come up here you can look at the castings on this car. This is the collar that was made and fused and the screw assembly and you know I would say that this is you know a late 1800s vice and it works great I mean what a testament to the craftsmanship of the uh, of the people that made it and if you look at the pictures you'll see it's it's really pretty simple it just knocks down my research has indicated these were extremely utilitarian, kind of like Crocs were back in the day. Uh, they made them by the millions, and anybody that was, you know, out in the wilderness needed this to uh, to do whatever blacksmithing work they needed done on their farms or their homes. And uh, I'm just I'm just crazy happy that I have this piece. <laughs> so as fate would have it, that same day I was going. I went to a uh, a family run estate sale and down in the basement was this Charles Parker vise. This is a small one. This is only three inches. The jaws on the uh, post vise are five and it had a sold sticker on it. So I went upstairs and I asked the lady, I said, you know, is that vice downstairs sold? And she says, oh no, that was my husband's and uh, we had another sale here and but it hasn't been sold. I'm not exactly sure what she meant by that but I got this for five dollars. It had been painted into the bench and I, once I got the bolts out I really had to whack it a couple of times as hard as I could with my palm to get it to break the, the paint. But the cool part of this is that, and hopefully you can read that, it has a property tag on it from Consolidated Edison. Con Ed is the power company in New York City and the family that had this was from Long Island. They had relocated to Georgia. So I'm going to restore this, and, and when I restore a vise, I don't try to make it look like a piece of jewelry. What I'll do is take it all apart, we'll get the paint off of it, we'll wire brush off any rust, and then I'll treat it with fluid film, and then we're going to put it back to work. So that's what we're going to do for the rest of the video, so I hope you enjoy it. Okay, moving in here. Here's the patent date of 1910, which is actually the patent date for the swivel mechanism for the vise. It's a number 21, and I'll turn you around. And there's the property tag for Con Edison. What do you say we speed this restoration up just a little?
it's really pretty cool. This uh, this piece here is actually a wedge, and when you tighten it from the bottom, it pushes down and spreads these out. They act like brake shoes to keep the uh, the bikes from turning. As you can see by using the wire wheel after we degreased it, we've got this piece polished right up and ready to go. As I said before, I'm not going to paint it, so at this point when it's polished like this, what I like to do is hit it with some fluid film so I don't have any flash rush issues. And fluid film is just, in this case, comes in an aerosol, it also comes in a liquid. It's a lanolin based rust preventative, and you just spray it on and wipe it on and it will prevent uh, rust and protect your pieces. So I'll do this one and these and then I'm going to go outside and we'll wire wheel off the two big pieces. Okay, we're going to start to wire brush off the two bigger pieces. Listen, anytime you're using a grinder or any of this power equipment, protect yourself. I've got breathing equipment on, a face mask, gloves, and hearing protection. Okay, my intention here is to get off as much of this paint as I can, then I'll come back with stripper and get the rest of it off. I just don't feel like dealing with stripper today. I've got the piece clamped up in my palm grin vise that I took off of my drill press. This thing is perfect for this job. So we got this one, this one, and this one to do. I'll do these off camera, I'll bring you back. Okay, we've wire brushed and got off as much of the paint as we can, but there's just some corners here that we just can't get to with the wire brush. So we're going to use some regular methylene chloride stripper to get these off. Now, I did strip a small part of this a couple of days ago or yesterday or whatever, and as I recall, the, the paint was really gooey. So I don't know uh, how this is going to strip off, but excuse my arm. But we'll just uh, brush some stripper on there. Keep it wet, let it work in around the lettering and up in the corners and it looks like the paint's coming off. If anybody's interested, there was a, uh, a flat gray color under the white. That's probably the color that came from the factory. Very similar to what you see, uh, well that might be it right there, what you see here. All right, we'll get all three pieces uh, stripped off, and then we'll rinse them with some water, dry them off, and fluid film them, and then we'll put this whole thing back together. So I'll bring you back. In any of the tough places, I've got a, uh, a couple of little wire brushes here, and I'm just using it to get into the, the tight corners to get the last of the paint out. If there's a corner that that one won't reach in, this one will, because it's got this little tuft of brush on the back that 
really gets into the really gets into the corner as well. And the other place that the paint is stubborn is on any of these little pits in the casting, much like the rough grain of oak where paint will settle in there. Paint settles into those and it takes a little effort to get it out. But we're making good progress. Here it is all done, just the way I like it. Bare metal protected with fluid film. It shows some scars of use. If you look up here, you can see. And up here. But you can't ask for a nicer, better built vise. And I paid $5 for it. And all it took was a couple of hours to pretty it up. And she's going to go back to work. And you can see there, Consolidated Edison. So from Meriden, Connecticut, to New York City, to Ackworth, Georgia, and our shop just outside Kennesaw here in North Georgia. Best regards. Thanks for watching. Take good care. We'll see you next video. Maybe we'll do some furniture. <laughs>